Hey, this is Matt Johnson with Viral Marketing, and I'm excited to uh, welcome you to the latest installment of the Expert Advisor Hangout. And we've got the uh, the heaviest of heavy hitters today. We've got both Brian Moses and Jay Kinder with us. And before I turn it over and let those guys cut loose on on lead generation and prospecting and how to get to triple digit numbers in deals, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can ask questions. We've got plenty of time set aside for Q and A today. So if you uh, there's two ways to ask questions. Number one. Now that we are live, you can use the Q&A app right here on Google+, and your questions will show up, and all three of us can see them. Uh, the other option, if that doesn't work for you, is just to type them in as a comment right here on the Google+, Plus page below the video that we're watching right now. So I'll keep an eye on all those. I'm going to bring, uh, bring the questions to the guys as we go along. We want your questions, and we'll answer them right here on the air, so be sure to send those in. So with that, let me turn it over to, uh, to Brian. How's it going today? Going great, Matt. Thanks for having us today. I'm really excited. You know, um, it's a rare opportunity when somebody has an opportunity to get inside the brains of one of the most brilliant phenomenons in real estate, and it's a privilege and a pleasure to um, invite Jay Kinder to our hangout today. Hey, Jay, how you doing? Looking good hey. down there. <laughs> Brian, I, I, I appreciate that. You're too kind, my friend. Uh, given the fact that you were my mentor for years, uh, you should take that as a compliment yourself. Well, I appreciate that. Um, you know, J I met Jay, I don't know, probably close to 15 years ago. And um, I was a lot younger, and Jay was a lot younger. And I was doing pretty well in real estate. And I've watched Jay grow his business over the years. One thing I can tell you about Mr. Kinder is he's a uh, voracious learner and implementer. And um, I'm excited for everybody to hear his story today. I'll kind of lead the discussion. But I would really suggest that you all have a pen and paper handy because there's going to be a billion gems in this call. And Jay has a tendency when he gets rolling, it just starts flowing. So um, I, would, I would fasten your seatbelts and hang on. But let me just describe, Jay, you know, I, you really are a business phenomenon. Um, you have had so much success in recent years. It's truly awe-inspiring to be around you, to uh, work with you, and to call you a friend. But for the people that don't know you, I think that it's important. A couple of things. You're a voracious learner. You're a mad-ass implementer. And um, I don't know if we – Matt, I apologize. I used the foul word 30 seconds into the, uh, <laughs> into the hangout. But I'm very offended, but I'll get over it. I apologize if I've offended anybody, but Jay has more <laughs> ambition, you know, more ambition in his pinky than I have had in my entire body. And uh, he inspires me every day. He makes me grow. He, I'm learning from him. And I'm, uh, you know, without further ado, let's let's ask Jay the first question. Jay, tell your story. You know, you're from Lawton, Oklahoma. Tell him a little bit about the town of Lawton. What, how, why, and why and how did you get into real estate? Before I do that, Brian, I, I have to. It's not fair to the audience to to for them to not know your level of success, in my opinion. And you're you're a humble guy, so I know you're not going to talk about it. But you know the the you know the fact that when I ran into you, you know you were the number two coal banker agent in the world, selling 400 and something homes a year. And um, you know the, you know this is uh, this will be a special uh, you know, a special hangout because. You know, it's very rarely that you you know you you get someone that's been at that caliber of of you know of success asking someone at you know the same level of success questions, and you're, there's going to be a lot of things that who knows what will come out of this. So, um, you know, it's it's always a pleasure, Brian. Obviously, we're friends and we spend a lot of time together, and and I, you're, I feel like your family. So this is you know we we didn't talk before this, so I don't know what questions you're going to ask me, and um, I'm just hoping to be able to. Um, to add some value to the people that do tune in, and and hopefully uh, you know share some really a shortcut to success um, for anybody who's listening, that, you know pick up some nuggets on how to get there faster, how to do it with less uh, stress and and challenges along the way. So uh, that being said, Bry, um, you know my 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 journey into real estate, <laughs> um, you know started you know after you know I was 19 years old, basically got my real estate license, immediately took a Dill Carnegie course. Um, thanks to my dad, and my dad was actually a broker. They had just bought a coal banker in Lawton, Oklahoma. It's a very small town, 100,000 people. Um, and uh, so, you know, at a very young age, I, I mean, I didn't know what I didn't know. So, um, you know, I got into real estate at a very, very young age, very impressionable. I saw, I saw a lot of opportunity, liked people, um, liked dealing with people. 
uh, previous job, um, so you know I didn't have a PhD or anything. I was mowing yards uh, prior to selling real estate, and I had a, um, a semester and a half of college under my belt. I want to say I'm not sure that all of those hours actually counted towards my uh, degree. I never received, but uh, uh, so it certainly wasn't a born to be successful <laughs> in real estate uh, transition for me. But uh, yeah, so I've been doing it my whole life basically. Is what it feels like 17, almost 18 years now. So that first year in real estate, what was that like for you? Because um, I know you have, I know you have, yeah, mine yeah. too. Mine was too, but yeah. I know you very, have a work I think, ethic. I think I was a little bit optimistic uh, as to how well it was going to go. I'll never forget as long as I lived. Before I got my license, my dad had uh, an agent, and he was wrote out a commission check, and my dad always signed the commission checks, and and it was a guy named Rusty, uh, and there was an agent. And uh, it was a 3500 and some change. So I want to say like $3,594 check. And my dad stops me in the hall. Of course, I'm there trying to beg for my $20 per yard you know, uh, check for mowing yards that day so I can go buy a case of beer. And, uh, you know, and he shares with me this $3,500 something dollar check. You know, and I, that's more money than I would make in a couple of months. Uh, so I was like, what the heck did he do today? You know what I'm saying? You know, he looks like he's just kind of hanging around the office all day. I mean, what did he do to get a check like that? So that was kind of my introduction to, you know, to what I thought was possible. Um, you know, you know, and I, that's all, you know, that was all it took for me to be convinced. Okay, well, if you can do pretty much nothing, which is what it seemed like most real estate agents in my dad's office, I've been around it my whole life. It didn't seem like they worked nearly as hard as it was out there mowing yards. Um, that I could find a way to sell a house or two every month, and and uh, you know, it would be the greatest thing ever. But that wasn't exactly how it transitioned. That's awesome. So fast forward to, um, and you're a humble guy too. So I'm going to ask you some questions that are going to inspire people because I, I believe that people are inspired by greatness and um, I'll ask you this question so your first year how much business did you do how much money did you make you said you kind of, it was frustrating you, you kind of struggled sure. and so um, to the best of my recollection I know I got my license um, in the latter part of 1997 I want to say and the, <laughs> the, the, I didn't sell a house for the first three months the last three months of that year I was licensed and I did not sell a home the, the 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 next 12 months um, I sold 22 homes so my first full year in the business I sold 22 homes um, the the trick to that was um, the average sale price for me was a 49,000 and what happened was uh, my dad and uh, the rest of the people in the company basically did not want to take these little REO listings so um, I was like well I don't have anything else to do so I'll take these REO deals and uh, I only sold a handful of them, uh, but uh, it turned out, you know, to be a, a handful of transactions. I made, you know, like eight peanuts that year. I think if you, if I, I think I actually spent like twenty five thousand dollars to make the twenty two thousand dollars I ended up making that year, <laughs> and uh, and it was, you know, it was really, you know, not a very profitable year. But uh, I learned, you know, a little bit of a lesson about REO. You spend a lot of time, they don't listen, and then they fire you, and they listen with someone else and do what they, what you told them to do in the first place. So you know, learn, you know, that was my first lesson with the first year was like, okay, REO is a real pain. Um, mm -hmm. But I learned how to deal with it, and, and it did. You know, it was a piece of the business. I would say it's a very small pillar of my business, and it it was and has been ever since. Um, but it was certainly not uh, the answer, if you will, uh, to to being successful. But that was my my first indoctrination into real estate. I did a handful of REO deals, and I, my sphere of influence was not. Of, of the buying a home age, I would say. Um, so very few people bought from me because they were in my sphere of influence. So I had to really figure out, like, what's a way to get a client? I mean, that was my focus every day was how do I get a client? That was uh, the hardest part of uh, the job. Okay, and then, so 22 sales, your first first full year in the business. What was your best year in the business? Um. Yeah, I would have to. I would um, have to redefine what. Pay attention, pay attention, folks. Watch what's about to come. Yeah. So, if you want to look at the number of transactions, and historically, I would say that the year that I sold 531 homes was uh, that was my best year in real estate. Wow. Uh, but that's not true. The reality is, the best year that I've had in real estate has been every single year that I've stepped out of my business and not had to step foot in the business and it continues to uh, be profitable without me and the reason I put it that way is because you know my mindset and I know we kinda titled this you know 
Google Hangout, you know, how to go from 25 transactions to 100 transactions. But I think what became clear to me as I built this giant business to, you know, 500 plus deals, I had almost 15 percent market share in my little town. I mean, I was one out of every eight sales. I was at the closing tables sitting on one side or the other. Mm. So I was just, you know, it was dominating uh, in terms of that and very successful if you look at it from that perspective. But the, you know, my quality of life was absolutely not what it is today. And when I sold 200 homes, which was my third or fourth, I think my third or fourth year in the business, um, I made way more money than I did uh, take home than I did uh, when I sold 531. And we'll probably end up talking about some of why that was in this call. Yep. I'm sure, depending on the questions you have for me, Brian. But that, that's um, you know, those are just you know, kind of my my mindset reflecting back on you know the years. It's more important now that the quality of life is there and the business is profitable and it requires less of me. Uh, where in the past. Um, you know, it was all about, you know, give me a trophy uh, for selling a bunch of houses, and I thought that was success, and that certainly is not the case, because you can't take those to the bank, is what I've learned. Uh, got a whole right. collection. They're not really worth anything. <laughs> so that's, the reason I asked that question is I wanted to make it very clear for the people watching and hanging out with us today that the title of the Hangout, How to Go from 25 to 100 Deals a Year, um, is very possible because you've done it. I also want them to take away from this that it's not what you make, it's what you keep, and it's the quality of your life. And I don't think there's a person on this Hangout that is interested in having less of a quality of life. So we all have that in common. Um, and we all came from humble beginnings. Nobody was born you know, selling 200, 300, 400 houses a year. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, one other question before we get into the strategies and tactics of, of a few things that they could do today to go from 25 to 100. But what was your best month in the business? Can you think of, you know, I can remember back and think, wow, that was my best month, and then that was the marker, and I kept trying to do that every month. But describe what a good month is uh, or was or is currently for you. I know you're not in the business anymore. Maybe what it is today and what it was back in the day. Yeah, so so for today a good month is because um, that's all I look at is the P and Ls. Um, you know, the best month I probably ever had was a couple of hundred thousand dollar month. I remember that that I remember the first time I had two hundred thousand in a month. That's a big deal. I mean, wow. you, when you're doing deals and and that, and in lot and again the average sale price is like you know hundred thousand ish, a little bit more than that maybe. You know, you you got to sell a lot of houses, you got to close yeah. a lot of deals, and and it just takes a lot of effort to get to that that kind of cash flow. Um, and that was always, you know, that was just a, you know, a huge milestone. Getting the hundred, the first hundred thousand dollar month was a huge milestone. Like when you think about making a hundred thousand dollars in a month, I mean, like yeah. I never dreamed that was really. I mean, I knew there was no limit to what was possible, but like, man, when you do it, it's like it kind of take it takes you back a little bit. It's like, man, that's pretty awesome. Hundred thousand yeah. dollars in a month, and that, and that's you know pretty regular for for both of the real estate companies that we own today to to be able to produce a hundred thousand dollars in a month. But you know, it's it's you know really what's the profit margin? So I'm looking at it a little bit differently just from where I'm at now. But but I am focused on profit, and and uh, there, there's a lot of reasons why that is because I failed miserably and nearly lost everything as I as I um, you know haven't got to really share that part of the story. But you know I, I built it up to 531 transactions, and it was like 07, 08. The market goes to crap. And I had, you know, developments. I had new construct. I never failed. Every month, I got every year, I got better. So I just felt like I'm, every month's going to get better. I guess this is just how it works. And you know, I had the worst year of my life in 2008, and uh, nearly lost everything. Uh, I mean, down to the, you know, I, 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 I have no shame in sharing, you know, the story. And you know, it got down to the point where I literally called the bank and tried to get them to negotiate whether they would let me skip a payment, paying my boat payment. And you know the reason that I, I, you know, I was just, you know, it was just strapped, and I didn't understand the numbers. I didn't understand financially what what mattered, and I, and um, you know, as you grow the business really big, you got to understand those things. So you know, going from 25 to 100, really easy to do profitably. Going from 250 to 500 profitably, you better yeah. you better have some guidance because uh, um, you know, there's some two by fours that you may not see that are coming and. Uh, you know the financial side of it becomes really critical, and it just wasn't something I learned at Walters High School. So you know I learned it the hard way. So um, it seems to be that I learned everything that way, but it's all right with me. One more question that um, I think would everybody would benefit, and I'm curious to hear the answer to this too. And then we'll 
we'll go into what would you do if you were doing 25 deals a year to get to 100 and do it profitably. But the question I want to ask you right now is, what inspired you to, to do that, to figure it out and to share it with everybody? What inspires Jay Kinder today? You know, um, yeah, you know, I get this question a lot, actually, Brian, and um, it's always hard for me to answer because, you know, it's never been about the money, you know, um, that, you know, the money's a scorecard for, you know, success if you're doing it right. And, and it, it, it's there, but it's not, you know, it's not the focus. But uh, to me, it's, it's always been about doing it better and just improving it, just doing it better, can do it better, can do it better. And, and always being open to, okay, well, what did I learn here? What's the lesson that I can learn? And how do I grow personally? How, how do I grow and, and get better? And how do we make this better? So for me, it's just, there's just this, obsession if you will about yeah. doing it right and and it's really really like ingrained in me like I'm just I'm, it doesn't matter what I'm doing I don't I mean it doesn't matter if I'm trying to learn how to wakeboard for the first time or if, you know if we're you know if, if we're working on a project we're trying to solve you know that you know to crack the code for getting the buyer to call you and hire you instead of trying to do a home search first I mean like it's just this just ridiculous obsession with getting it right yeah um, I think that 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 is probably what's responsible for my ridiculous you know effort in it you know that goes into everything that we do so um, I think that's what inspires me more than anything that's awesome. it's curiosity and a, obsession to do it right you know what I'm saying can it be better let's debate, make it better let's do it better than that uh, how could it be better you know just keep asking those right questions that drive you forward instead of asking you know self-limiting questions that hold you back let me share let me share a story and a testament to that because that is Jay Kinder. If you looked up Jay, if Jay Kinder was in the dictionary, he would the definition would be a man who tries to find a better way. And I'll <laughs> give everybody an example for that. Jay has a script for converting buyers to walk in appointments, meaning they get in their car, they drive across town, they meet with you before they go look at a house, they get the, they meet with you before they get pre-approved. He's systems and processes driven, and about 70% of the buyers that are spoken to result in an appointment. And Jay and I were having a conversation about a year ago, and he's like, you know, I'm tired of having to sound like other real estate agents, because we're not like other real estate agents, and it would be really great if real estate agents would see the differentiation and improve you. He said, you, you know, let's work on finding a better script. I'm like, seven out of ten is phenomenal get lost dude that's like that's like taking all the money that's getting it all and um, he kept working with me working with me working with me and man we're working on this right now as we speak um, and I think we've cracked the code on it but we're, we're gonna test everything before we we share it with you so I'm excited about that but it's definitely a testament to Jay Kinder always finding a better way Let's to give the, some to the of driving Brian Moses crazy. <laughs> well, I, you know, but it stretches me and it makes me grow too. And I'm yeah. like, I'm really excited. I texted him last night and I go, I got yeah. this. I got, we yeah. got this now. This has been this is something. This is something we've been talking about for two almost two years now. We've mm -hmm. been working. On it. So this but, is you know, it. Yeah, nice. but I, you know, I'm philosophical too, and I I read a lot and have read tons and invested in myself. And what I know to be certain is that nothing originates in life without first becoming a thought. Mm -hmm. And Jay uh, has a quote on a picture for, of Steve Jobs, and it says, those people that are, think they're crazy enough that they can change the world are, th are the people that usually do. And um, Jay, you are crazy. You come up with some wild, audacious goals, and you're like, let's do it better, and let's get better results. And I go, you're crazy, dude. But... That's why you are the person you are. And well, I appreciate so let's, let's get back into this. I'm, I'm hanging out with Jay Kinder and Brian Moses today. I'm doing 25 deals a year or X number of deals a year. I want to be profitable. I, don't wanna, I want a better quality of life. I want to get towards 100. Maybe 100 is not my number, but I definitely want to grow and I want to improve and I want to be more profitable and I want to have more quality of life. What would you, what would you advise that person? Uh, so, so the first, the first thing, Brian, I would, I would say is that let's let let's get clear on the money goal first, because one thing that I've found um, in 
you looking back and you know you, you know when you're when you're when you own a company that helps agents grow their business like you get asked this question a lot so I, I get to reflect on I get to think about it I get to kind of go back in time if you will and think what you know why did this work in this situation and it didn't work in this situation so you get to analyze your thoughts and, and the decisions and how you've done things and how people become successful and which ones don't and 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 it it occurred to me not that long ago that, that the most important thing was getting clear on what's the number that you're trying to make okay so what's the goal the goal isn't a hundred transactions the goal is how much ever money that represents for the most part it, you, you, I don't believe that there's anybody that's watching this hangout that says that I want to make a hundred transactions if those hundred those that hundred transactions represented only ten thousand dollars in revenue right so, and, con and conversely if it whatever their number goal was, if they could do it with half the number of transactions, why not do, do less and make the same? So, so the, this is something that I picked up. Jay Abraham has always, he's been a mentor of ours for a long, long time. And he's just, he's really, he really pushes back on your way of thinking. And as much as he's kind of difficult for a lot of people to really um, engage with, um, he is, he's a genius. He's really a genius and he's a genius in the way that he forces you to think differently and it's been a tremendous value to me and and I would just challenge you to think differently that the goal and this is what he always says is well first what is the goal and then he says is that really the goal wow. and in this situation when you think about that the goal really isn't 100 transactions the goal really is whatever that might represent in terms of income and um, at least for most of us and 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 I'm open to someone disagreeing with me that the money that, that the money doesn't matter. But unless you have the money, um, you can't do you can't do you can't have the freedom you want. You can't have the peace of mind you want. You can't help your kids and your family the way you want. You can't give it all away if that's what you want to do. Um, so the money does matter. And, and 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 I think the more important thing is you have to start with the money because if you don't understand how much money it's going to take for you to do whatever it is you want to do with your goals and whether it's just this year or the next five years or next ten years, if you don't know what the amount of money you need to do what it is you want to do uh, to be successful or to be happy or to, to, to be comfortable or to have security or to be able to give half of it away, whatever it is, um, then, then you're going to have a real hard time reverse engineering all of the different ways that there are to get to that monetary goal, right? So mm -hmm. the next question becomes, okay, so the goal really is this number. So hopefully everybody on the, you know, on the, on, on this is taking the time to say, well, here's my goal right here, this mm -hmm. amount of money. And if you if you've taken the time to do that, which everybody I hope you are doing, uh, write down your number, then say, okay, what are all the ways that we could accomplish this, right? So it's not just well, let's go sell a bunch of houses. It's what are all of the ways that we can possibly reach this income goal. And, and that forces you to think at a much deeper level of all of the things and the activities that you engage in on a day-to-day -day basis that result in closed transactions. And you know you, what your goal is is to reverse engineer what's the you know what's the most predictable, consistent things you can do on a day-to-day -day basis that's going to drive you to that goal. And that and that, if you start there, it's really not as complex as I think a lot of people make it. It's really a lot easier because. You know, you do the math, right? So, Brian, is the average sale price, if you're not stuck in a lot in Oklahoma, um, you know, your average sale price nationwide is, you know, couple, you know, 200,000 is NAR, according to NAR. So, whatever your average is, if it's 200,000, you're talking about a 6, 3% 3, 3 commission is 6,000. If you're on a split, it could be a little bit less than that. You probably, if you're listening to this webinar, you probably shouldn't be on a split uh, uh, with a brokerage. Uh, sorry, brokers that are out there. If your agents are listening, mm -hmm. you should probably tune out now. <laughs> um, but you know, you know, if you're if you're doing any of the business on your own and the broker isn't giving you any business, they're not providing you any value, then you should be on a high split. And I think everybody pretty much knows that. That's kind of the industry standard. But you know, at you know five or six thousand um, dollars per transaction, um, how many of those do you need to do to hit that number that you're trying to hit, right? So you know, that, there's your math, and, and it usually results in three or four or five. You know, to make a hundred thousand dollars, or realistically, a hundred transactions, if you do the math on this real quick, it ends up being a half a million dollars, which I think for most everybody is a pretty significant amount of money. So to make half a million dollars a year, how many deals do you have to do at an average commission of five thousand? And it's just not that many transactions. I mean, when you really look at it, it's not. It, I think, and I think, hopefully, when you're doing the math on this and you see that you know in your market it only takes you maybe seven transactions a month or five, whatever it is. Um, 
to get to a half a million dollars, that that's that's a digestible. Okay, I can I can accept how I could get to five hundred thousand. It's it becomes something that's doable, and you can see it. It's like concrete now. And if you don't take the time to do that, I feel like everything else you do after that just becomes do 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 do, and mm -hmm. it's not really you're not really um, you're not really being strategic about what you're doing because you don't really know exactly where you're trying to get. And I, I just it seems simple. Maybe everybody does this, and I'm wasting your time. But I feel like that's the most important first step you can take is getting clarity on what success looks like, and then um, is that the goal? Is that really the goal? And then what are all the ways to accomplish that goal? And that's probably um, you know the, the the really the first step in the process to getting to a hundred transactions or a half a million dollars or whatever it is that you want to do in anything in life. Cool. So if anybody has any questions, we're hanging out with Jay Kinder. I'm Brian Moses. We've got Matt Johnson here. Matt will explain to you how you can get your questions answered. And uh, I'll continue with Jay until we start getting some questions. But we'd love to make this interactive. And it's an opportunity of a lifetime to get your questions answered by the one and only Jay Kinder. Yeah, so uh, so guys, just post your questions. If you if you have trouble with the Q&A app, uh, that's the best way to do it right here on the Google Plus page is through the Q&A app. And you can type in your questions, and they'll show up for all three of us. But if you can't do that, if it's just not working for you, just submit them right as comments. Just post them as comments right on the Google Plus page. I'm keeping my eye out on it. That way, I can bring the questions to uh, Brian and Jay. So, awesome. Thanks, Matt. So, Jay, just to recap, um, number one, think about everything that you want to accomplish in the course of a year, and figure out how much money you need to do to to make that a reality. And that would include things like paying your income taxes, putting money in the bank. How, you know, how many of you hanging out with us would like to have more cash in the bank next year at this time than you have right now? How much more cash would you like to have? So what Jay's saying is list it all out, come up with how much money you need to make in the next 12 months to do it, figure out how many transactions you need to accomplish that. And then the second thing that he said, which I thought was beyond brilliant, list all all the things that you can do, it doesn't mean you're going to do all of them, but be open to all the things you can do to accomplish that. And I would imagine there would be some prioritization that would come in the third step. What would you do beyond that, Jay? Yeah, so so the um, the, fir the first thing that, that I would say about that list that you're making is, you know, you want to pay attention to the things that you're currently doing, right, that are working. So. Um, you know, if you're doing 20 or 30 or 40 deals or whatever it may be, uh, um, or if you've done any deals, you know what I mean? There might be something that's working well that you can do more of than you're doing. So, you know, part of the process of trying to determine right things in the right order is getting clarity on what things you should be doing. So, you know, for most of us, and what I've found, um, you know, is that we don't know exactly what else we should be doing or what we should be doing less of. Um, so getting some clarity on that, which we'll talk about here in a second, but, um, you know, if there's anything you're doing that's working, and, and I know that early in my career, you know, it's funny because I set this financial goal. And I went, I have these. I actually have this committed action plan that has every year I've been in real estate. Every single year I was in real estate for like the first 10 years, I had to, I kept in this binder. And my first year goal was uh, 35,000. Actually, it was my second year goal um, was to make thirty-five thousand dollars. Well, I made fifty-seven thousand or seventy-seven thousand, and the next year was like two, you know, a hundred thousand. It was like two hundred thousand. It's like Wait, 500,000 million, you know, so like it was crazy to me, like I literally would lay out this plan and, and this is how many deals I need to do, this is how many buyers, this is how many sellers, and that's all I got to do to get to that, okay, and it just became so doable, right, so, but then it was reflecting on, well, where did my last 10 deals come from, okay, well, this one came from an open house, hmm, interesting, okay, this one came from prospecting the FISBOs and expired, this one came from, um, you know, from a referral, this one came from, what? so you start to get clear on, well, something's working here, and you start to just kind of get clear on what is working, and maybe what you might want to do more of, and what there's more opportunity for you to do more of, and so you know, always look there, I mean, there's always going to be something that you're doing right, and, and, and if it's something that's predictable that you can do more of, then you want to do more of it, so, um, but that's, that's kind of where you start, um, and, then, and the next step is, what, what is going to get you the greatest return on, on investment of your time, effort, and energy? Um, and you want to start doing more of those things and get other things off your plate. So. Okay, cool. So that poses two additional questions that I have for you. What are some absolute, based on your experience, and uh, you're open, you're one of the most open and candid people I've ever met. 
Uh, you're not ashamed to tell people what you've done that hasn't worked. What are some things that real estate agents today are doing that they absolutely shouldn't be doing? Yeah. So, um, I, 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 there, this gosh, man, I don't even know where to start. Um, you know, we can start with all my screw ups, uh, or we can start with you know some of the biggest. You know, I think misconceptions there are out there in the success in real estate. I would say a, a lot of real estate agents make the mistake of hiring agents to be on their team, and they buy a buyer lead platform to, um, and then they end up managing agents and instead of closing deals. Um, I think that's one mistake that a lot of agents make early, trying to get to 100 transactions. That you end up getting to 100 transactions, but you end up doing it at a, a far, far less profitability than you should. Um, yeah. I think a lot of real estate agents spend a lot of money on lead generation where they shouldn't. I think a lot of real estate agents spend a lot of money on um, direct mail marketing before they ever should. Um, I think um, um, a lot of time and effort and energy gets spent doing just generally unproductive things. Um, period. Um, you know that this aren't this aren't profitable. So they're not leveraging um, their time by hiring an admin. Maybe they're afraid to make a hire, whatever the case may be. But when you look at the dollar per hour activities that you do on a day to day basis, the things that drive revenue, the things that get you face to face with a seller, um, are the things that are, you should do. And then I don't. I just. I, I feel like most agents don't do that consistently. Um, and that's you know that's the, you know the ebbs and flows, right? Like if you if your mm -hmm. business has really really good month. Then kind of you know you're closing all those deals and no sales you know very few sales and then, you know really really good month you know and you just have these this it's the roller coaster and I think we've all experienced it um, it was one heck of a roller coaster ride for me too um, you know but it's you know figuring figuring out that you know the right process is to have you face to face with more seller clients how do I do that and do only that and ignore everything else is how you get there I mean it's really pretty much that simple. <laughs> So you, you, you use words that just, um, I don't think the average real estate agent, and I hope they're picking up on your language when you talk about income and revenue and um, dollar productive activities and just some of the different words that you use are um, eye-opening. What, if thinking about the people that are hanging out with us today, doing 25 deals a year, whatever it is that they're doing, they want to be more profitable. Um, when you look at your calendar, Jay, you know, I am, I'm privileged to work with you and see your calendar. And um, Jay schedules everything. You're, you know, and he has chunks of dollar productive activities. Maybe you can talk to them a little bit about um, calendaring because, you know, I remember, and you probably relate to this too, Jay, you remember in the early years when we were not making the kind of money that we're making today, um, there are reasons for that. And that's because we'd go in the office and we'd look around and go, uh, what should I be doing today? Hmm. Well, when's, when's that yeah, phone going to I spent a lot of time doing, doing that. <laughs> you know, talking to people in the office. So can you talk a little bit about hey, scheduling and some of those distinctions? Black folder off my desk. My my little binder folder. I'm gonna show. I'm gonna actually demonstrate uh, uh, this process in act, kind of in in being in use. Awesome. It's not, it's not perfect because nobody's perfect, and I don't. It I'm, not always, it, I'm perfect. It, it can always be better, right, always. Jay? <laughs> yeah. yeah there, <laughs> there goes that mindset again. Right? <laughs> Never, no matter what, it's always can be better, and and I certainly don't. Yeah, this one right here. So. You know, so yeah, time management. So, so we're going to get into meat and potatoes uh, here shortly, and it and it will be some really good stuff. I promise. We won't waste your time. But if you can see this, um, this is probably not the best way to demonstrate this. Sorry, but this is how prepared <laughs> I was. So th this this is a list of things that I that I look at on a daily basis. The things that end up in my calendar, and and I cross them off as I get that done. As you can see, I got a lot of shit to do right now. So that's, that's just with one company. So there's a whole other company, which is our brokerage, which actually, um, uh, this this one actually was created in, what was the date on that, say, one fit one? So January, in January. So in Jan since January, I've got quite a bit of things done, uh, but I got a lot more to do. And and this is just a, I mean, it might seem simple, and I'm just, done. this is my personal list of things to do, and I'm not really sure what's on there. It looks like 
Oh, so yeah, I have to I have to pick up my lawnmower um, because it's been raining 24/7 in Texas. Um, and my so Jay, this is like a like a master task list, and then every week you're sitting down and looking at what, yeah. what are the things on this master list that I can book in my calendar for this week. Yeah. So 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 here's a here's the thing. So and thank you for asking that question, Matt. The 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 thing that I've realized is that I have ADHD. Okay. So. I'm probably the world's worst um, when it comes to remembering everything that needs to be remembered and doing all the things in the right order. And if you got three listings and two sellers call and they want this and that, and you got a handful of closings going, it can get out of control really quick. So you know, for me, and having multiple companies just makes it a thousand times more important because you have to do the most important things. There are critical things, and then there's important things. And there's certain things that you only change the outcome in, and there's things that you don't change the outcome in. And the goal is to do none of the things that you don't change the outcome in and do all the critical things and the most important things. And what helped me dramatically with, you know, you know, and I would say it's, I'm going to give this credit to Chet Holmes for writing The Ultimate Sales Machine. Um, and in that first chapter, I'll never forget, I was really busy, and I, I was just not getting things done that I needed to get done. Very chaotic. Um, Chaos was my life, and, and if you've been there or you're there, I promise you, read chapter one of The Ultimate Sales Machine, and he talks about pig-headed discipline, and, and then I read another book from Dan Kennedy called the No BS Time Management book or whatever, whatever, and I'd read Eat That Frog, so I'd read a lot of books on time management, but it, was just, it wasn't me. I wasn't managing time. It was managing me. And and you know between all of those books, I, I really picked up on this pig-headed discipline that Chet Holmes talked about. Like you have to have pig-headed discipline. And I like people, so when my insurance agent stops in the office and wants to just chat, you know, I would just chat with him for 30 minutes. But I had something else I needed to be doing, and I just became pig-headed discipline. That I mean, I you know I don't know about everybody else. I try to do this without uh, getting emotional, and I suck at that. Um, <laughs> I do, and it, just because it bothers me. And uh, damn it, I usually don't get that bad. Um, you know, I missed a lot of my kids' games early in my business, right? So you don't get those days back. So you know, you can either be pig-headed this one about your time, or you you cannot. So yeah. um, you know, and and uh, it's a choice. You know your 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 life is chaos because it's a choice, and either you wanna you you wanna fix it, and you wanna you wanna be in control of your life, or you don't. And and once you realize it's 100% in your control because you're the one that sets your calendar, you're the one that determines if you're gonna answer the phone, you're the one that works on whatever it is you're gonna work on, and and either you're doing those things or you're not doing those things. And if you and you have to look at people that are taking and vampiring your time. You have to look at that as they're taking time around away from your family, and when you treat it that way, man, it's a whole nother way of looking at it. And it just took me a long time to learn that lesson, I guess. Yeah. Um, and and I know every I just know there's more people out there that that probably experience that and probably don't have to, you know. Yeah, so. and in fact, that's we've got like three questions, and so the questions are starting to come in, and there a lot of them are on this subject, Jay, and so we can address a lot of them at yeah, once. I'm happy to I'm happy to quit being a, a tit bag and answer these questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so both James and Tracy are asking, um, in order for you to do what you do best and delegate the rest, you really want to start with. Um, Either hiring a VA or what's what is kind of the next step if you're a solo agent doing twenty you know twenty to forty deals a year you don't have a team Jay what do you recommend for branching off do you recommend a virtual assistant should they start with uh, a, you know an assistant that's local um, what are you guys finding is working for NAEA members that kind of thing on on virtual assistants yeah there, there's 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 no question that this is like this transition is is critical. Um, you know, the, the first thing that, that I would say is that you have to be, you know, you should be tremendously busy uh, with face-to-face -face appointments from doing the dollar productive activities of making calls and, and calling sellers and getting face-to-face -face. And, and to the point that, that you have money coming in and that you're not getting to the things that, that, that are driving the money coming in um, and then you make that higher. And you, uh, you'll never look back. I mean, there, there's this kind of fear that, okay, what if it slows down? If you know with absolute clarity, which by the end of this, this hangout, you will know with absolute clarity what you should be doing daily and what you should be putting into your calendar and how you, how you make that determination so that you never have to you know, worry about money again, 
you know, you need to have, you know, 90 days worth of that salary for that person set aside. But I, I believe that having a full-time person, if you're going to be doing 100 deals, for instance, or if you're going to be making a half a million dollars, you can afford a full-time in your office all the time uh, person. And and you're going to want that. And so, you know, you can go with, a, um, you know, outsourcing, uh, but you never get the really the full leverage of being able to come in and say, here, do all this because I don't like doing this and I suck at it and and that's what you delegate first. You delegate. Let me tell you how to make your life better. Delegate the shit you don't like doing. Okay. Delegate the things that you're not good at and delegate the things that are the lowest producing items that make that you don't make a difference in. That you do not change the outcome or that someone else could do it and that you could teach them how to do it and have the same outcome. If you just do that, like real estate, your life will go from okay to I like I love real estate. This is a great business. But delegate the things you don't like. Your first person you hire is going to get all the shit you don't like doing. And just be okay with that. And then love them, you know, hug them and appreciate them and take care of them and they'll keep doing it for you. You know, but you got to find somebody that's probably a little bit of a different personality than you um, to to do that those things. So, yeah, I think that's probably the best strategy. Um, I didn't know. That's what I did. That's what I've learned since then is the really the, probably the right way to do it. Get things you don't like off your plate. Get things that aren't dollar productive off your plate and get the things that you're not any good at off your plate. Okay, So um, you know, if you do that, quality of life goes up and productivity goes up because you're going to be more excited. I mean, it just has a compound effect on what drives you know you, you know, forward in your business. So that, okay. that's, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, let, let's just expand on that for a second. I know we got a bunch of questions, but <clears throat> you and I know what dollar productive activities are. I don't want to assume that the people, when I was doing 25 deals a year, I had no clue what dollar productive activities were. You know, I, I, I had some luck, I made some money, and um, spent more than I was making. But So can you define what should be, yeah. they, what they should be doing daily, what should be in their calendar every single day religiously? Yep. So um, I, I, I'm going to be as I'm going to I'm going to tell this this is I'm going to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Okay. So um, there's a critical point in in my career and I, what I've seen in the careers of the most successful and the agents that have been the most consistently successful. Like meaning, never have really good year and then another bad year. Like they always grew and grew and be more profitable forever. Um, and 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 that is um, when you're doing 20 to 25 deals, you generally are your you know your open house, your referrals, your sphere of influence. Your you, know, you might be you know spend a little bit of money on leads. Um, hopefully you you maybe have been calling some expired and for sale by owners and and, and working that angle. Um, but you, you know you're doing a lot of things generally. Um, there's usually not just like, bam, I'm doing 25 deals. This is the one thing I'm focused on. That's not usually how we get to 25. Uh, we do it by doing a whole lot of things and uh, working long hours usually too. And the mistake that 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 I think most, um, I, I think I guess it's not a mistake. It's the thing that most people don't realize is that what it takes to be successful as a real estate agent is is getting down to one simple thing: is getting face to face with and I'm going to say sellers, and I'm going to say sellers for this reason. You can work buyers, but on average, you can take you can take your stopwatch and and you can time this. And if it's different for you, hey, great. But on average, this is what it's been: 21 hours to to close a buyer deal from start to finish, including the buyers that don't buy, because you're going to be driving this one around house to house to house to house. You can improve that process as much as you want. Some buyers will buy, some aren't. So you'll you're going to spend 21 hours before you get a check. With a, with buyers, maybe not the same buyer. You might show this buyer and they don't buy, and this one and they do buy, or the first one might buy. But if you you know if you average it out, it's been you know 18 to 21 hours. The time that I spend with a seller once I take a listing is never more than for me. It's not more than an hour. It used to be at the maximum maybe three hours. So um, and that's just just if you know because I didn't I delegated more pieces of it after after I learned more. But um, so you see three three hours or 21 hours, you make the same money. Okay. Mm -hmm. As much as I like working with buyers and I like showing houses and I like seeing the inventory that's on the market and I like that aspect of the business, it's really, really hard for me to work, um, ju justify um, saying I'm going to do seven times the amount of effort and work and time and I'm going to get the same money. So if if anyone can justify to me why that makes more sense to do that, then then I'm open to that. 
put your question in the little question box and we'll talk about it because it ain't gonna be <laughs> there ain't gonna be a way to do it. You can't get there. You can't get to a hundred deals. You can't get to half a million focusing on buyers. You got to focus on sellers. Got to. So as much as you may not like sellers and their asses sometimes to you, I can show you how to fix all that. But that that you and, and there's a there's a way to do that. You, but if if the focus and and it wasn't until Brian that I decided. And I don't even know why I decided, to be honest with you. I think I was actually at a Roger Butcher seminar, which this guy's been around forever. And, and he was talking about for sale by owners and this, that, and the other. I got so excited that I left the seminar, went driving around in Norman, called my dad. I'm like, I can't believe people aren't calling for sale by owners. This is the craziest thing. These people put signs in their yards and they want to sell and they don't have an agent. And like, I was like, this is stupid. I'm going to freak you. I mean, I'm like, I was excited. So I'm calling people in Norman, Oklahoma during the break of this seminar thinking I'm going to set listing appointments and just get referrals. I'm like, this is dumb. I can't believe it. I mean, because I just didn't know, right? I had no idea. I thought it was going to be that easy. It wasn't quite that easy. But you, 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 the point was that if, if I just focus, if I just call 10 for sale by owners today, I will set 10 appointments. You know why? Because for sale by owners don't qualify the buyer. They will set every single appointment <laughs> if you ask. They don't. They don't ask any questions. If you ask them to come see their house, they're gonna let you. If you get face to face with ten for sale by owners this month, I promise you're gonna list one. You probably even list three, if you get good. And and I think that the 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 reason people don't call for sale by owners and expires is this is this really this one simple reason, because they're trying to get the listing. That's it. Pay attention, everybody. If you're calling a for sale by owner and expired and you're trying to get the listing, you're just like every other monkey out there that's doing the same thing. And you know what they want to hear? None of your BS. They don't want to hear any of that. But let me and, – and when you ask them to list the house or when you're asking and you're pushing for that and you're pushing and you're selling, you're pushing, pushing, pushing. Resistance goes up. What, yeah, when you sell, there's resistance. And – and I don't like to sell. I hate selling. I'm not even good at selling. What I'm good at is helping people. And I think that's that was the mentality that I took was, you know what? I can help these people. I can help them better than they can help themselves. I mean, let's face it. For sale by owner puts a sign in the yard, or you just put it in the MLS and you get, you know, uh, you know, the rest of the entire marketplace in the world knows about it. Or you can try to sell it on your own and try to negotiate the deal. And let's see who's going to who's going to provide the most value. I mean, I believe that we do a better job than a for sale by owner, and everybody on this hangout should believe the same thing. So the approach is just different, right? Your approach is different. How do you help somebody? Um, how do you help them? How can I help them? Genuinely, I'm interested in what you're trying to accomplish and why and how do I help you? And here's the thing about another I – mean, going backwards a little bit on the focus on listings. So here's the thing that I've noticed. So our brokerage here in, in Frisco, every single time we take a listing, you know what happens? The phones blow up with buyers calling because it's a hot market. So just because I'm focused on listings and I'm ignoring everything else in the business, I'm going to accidentally have to sell a buyer if I just answer the phone. So by focusing on buyers, you're not creating additional listings, usually, not usually. Um, but by focusing on listings, you create buyers. So like by ignoring everything there is in the business, all these shiny objects and ideas and do this and leads and this lead platform and this technology and all this, and just focus on getting face-to-face -face with sellers, face-to-face -face with sellers, face-to-face -face with, -face with sellers. How do I help you accomplish your goal? What's your goal? How do I help you accomplish your goal? Just do that. You know what? You don't feel rejected because you're not. You're just trying to help them. If they don't want your help, screw them. You know what? doesn't matter. I was just trying to help. You know what I'm saying? Like it's a mindset shift, right? I mean, you know, you feel a little rejected when somebody doesn't want to work with you or whatever. But if you just are – I mean I've seen it. I was an example of it early on. If you're just nice to people and genuine – and try to help people. Guess what? People will do happen. business with you. They'll just—they don't even know you, but they'll trust you because you—that you genuine. You genuinely care about helping people. I think that's why real estate agents are successful a lot of times, and I know that's why we're successful a lot of times to a certain degree. But when you channel that passion for people and helping them to face-to-face -face with a seller, face-to-face -face with a seller, did I make any prospecting calls today, did I set any appointments today, how many people do I need to meet with this month to get my seven deals, I need to meet with 25 people, who did I call today, is it in your calendar, and when you're writing it down on the calendar I was just showing you, you put the value of that, so what's the value of a listing, you know, so an example, what you might find in mine, so a guy, uh, um, let's say I got a price reduction that I know needs to be made, but I've been not making it. I know I need to call this guy. 
if that house sells, what's it worth? Five grand. I'm going to put $5,000 right next to it on my little list. So when I'm scrolling down my list and I'm saying, what's the value of this activity? What's the value of this activity? What's the value of this activity? And I'm like, okay, if I do that, that might be worth 25 grand because this guy wants me to buy his house and, and I can flip it and da 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 So that's, shit, that's worth 25000 I'm going to do that one today. For sure, right? So I mean, it just be it becomes clear. Like, what's the things that drives value? Okay, if I make my prospecting calls and I set ten appointments and I know that I'm probably going to get three listings, that's worth fifteen grand. Shoot, I'm gonna make my calls today. It becomes easier for you to plan your day around what drives face to face. What makes money in real estate is getting face to face with sellers. Take everything awesome. else away from what we do, and just focus on getting face to face with sellers. I promise you, if you just do that and you ignore everything else then you will make more money in real estate because the dollar per hour, the value of the dollar per hour you spend with a seller is so much greater than it is with the buy side. And, and, and inherently, you will sell buyers. You will sell buyers because they will fall in your lap when you're putting the sign in the yard and they want to buy that house. I mean, it's crazy. It, happens, it, it happened here twice in the last couple of weeks. We can't help but sell buyers. We're not even trying to build the buyer side of the business, but we can't help but sell them because they're calling on all our listings and they're like wanting to make offers and you got to deal with it. And then you make a, then what happens? You sell a house and they're like, well, we want to move up and buy another house. Okay, well, I guess we'll go sell you another house if we have to. You know what I'm saying? But we're focused on the listing side of the business and all of a sudden we're doing, you know, four or five buyer deals here. So for you to make half a million dollars and I say focus on the listing side, doesn't mean don't answer your phone with the buyer calls. It means Focus on getting listings because if you can do that very well, you make people homeless. They gotta buy. You have sign calls that people call in. They gotta, you know, you'll you'll double in the listing. You can't double in the listing if you don't have one. So those are the that's the that's mindset that I feel like you have to get into if you really want to grow and be and, and get the most out of your um, you know day to day activities. Jay, I that's all. Rant there, so I'm that's, sorry. That's okay. It's all good. There were a lot of gems in there, and I know Matt's got some other questions. Before we go to the, back to the queue. I just want to let people know that you have graciously made available for a limited time a free business evaluation. And if they would like to speak with someone at Jay's company to identify where they are in their business, what the biggest opportunities are, there's no cost, no obligation for this, but if you're serious about growing your business, you can go to www.naea.com forward slash results. And I know um, Matt's going to put that URL up later, I believe, and we'll go back to the queue. Yep. So for now, I just the, the question that we have um, that just came in was from Cindy and, and about this event being recorded. And yes, it is. It's going to be right here on the page, and it's also going to be on the NEA YouTube channel. Uh, we also have a question from Wesley Willoughby. So he says, I did 27 deals last year. I've done 20 so far this year, and the goal is 40 plus for the year awesome. in general. So, right. Jay, what would you suggest to Wesley as the next step, or is his current need just an administrative assistant so he can keep going at his uh, his current pace? Yep. So, the the first question, and it, it what was it? It was James Will Will Wesley. 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 So, what I would what I would say at, at this point, first of all, keep doing what you're doing, buddy. Great job. I mean, that's I mean, you're doing things that are, you're finding success. The the at this point in the business, you're either 100% clear on the steps you need to take to get to 40 or you're not 100% clear. So, you know, getting that level of clarity is important because at this point, you, you know, you, you, hire, you hire someone. If you, if you continue to hire assistants, you should have, in my opinion, you should have two or three assistants before you, maybe four assistants before you ever hire a buyer agent, period. And, and, and a lot of you are not going to believe this. You will learn this lesson. I learned every lesson the same way. My dad told me things. My, I mean, it doesn't matter who told me and how much, how intelligent they were. Um, I <laughs> tend to crash into the wall first and go, oh yeah, oh, I guess now I get it. But when you hire agents, you end up being a sales manager. And there's a leadership and a um, accountability. There's an onboarding. There's a babysitting. Let me tell you, um, there's all of these things that happen. So. You know that you have to do that keeps you from doing what you were doing before. So now, when this lay layup buyer calls from one of your listings and you hand it to your buyer agent that you're hoping can at least hang onto the ball, at least to walk it into the end zone, um, and they don't do a really good job of that, you, where you would have made all that money, you make none of that money. So um, just be careful not to um, grow by adding a bunch of agents. That that's a false reality. It's not going to make you any more money. Delegate. Things and get start to get clear on what you do. Um, that's that that 
you know, and I guess be open to letting go of things you think can't be let go of. I used to think that I could not delegate the closing process. No way. I had to do it. Wrong. You can delegate. Um, I used to think that I had to present every offer to every seller. Well, who's going to do that? I mean, I obviously have to do that. I listed it. They know me. They love me. They're going to have to hear it from me or they're not going to, that's, they're going to hate me. Wrong. Delegated it. Um, you can delegate anything. And, and there's a process and there's a, an expectation that you set with a client. And there's all these things you can do to make it a value add instead of feeling like, you know, they're getting shuffled over to somebody. So, you know, you know just ask better questions of, of, of the things that you could get off your plate that you know you're not changing the outcome in. Now, if the deal's falling apart and you get on the phone, you can save the deal sometimes. I was good at saving deals. I would empower the person that I had in that place to do that. But if I need to, I'm going to get on the call if I change the outcome. So keep focused on, on what you do that changes the outcome. If you're trying to get to 40 deals, continue the focus of uh, the listing side of the business. And FISBO and Expired, I don't care what market you're in, Frisco is the biggest, fastest moving market I've ever experienced in my life. There's an expire. There's, there's, I think there's ten, something like ten or twelve expires every single day uh, that we can call. We can get, all we got to do is get face to face with a handful, and we're gonna make a bunch of money here. So you know, it, you know, th there's, there are always fizzbos. There are always expires in every market, good and bad. So don't tell me there's not. There are, and if, I, if you, unless you live in Podunk, middle of nowhere, where there's just not any homes for sale, and you're in a little bitty market, which just sucks. Um, and you, you know, and everybody used to tell me this. You should just move from Lawton. Well. And unfortunately, I spent my whole life building this business in Lawton and I ended up with 15% market share and regretted it that I, I wish I had moved to Dallas sooner because, you know, I spent my life building something and, and, and um, you know, I could have been spending that time, effort, and energy building something much larger um, in, in another market. So, you know, consider moving. <laughs> and I was told that too and I didn't listen. And so I don't expect everybody to listen to that. But it's something you can do. And be open to it. But, you know, if you do those things... Um, and, and you continue to try to get things off your plate um, and to an assistant and keep adding assistance and you keep doing the pro you keep making those calls to sellers you and you and the first thing you're going to spend any money on because first of all let me explain why you go for Fizbo expires you know what the cost per lead is zero nothing nothing else I can tell you is zero cost per lead nothing this is a business so you're gonna have to spend money and if you're spending money Here's the other thing. This is critical. I don't think I, I've never really actually talked about this before. Um, the reason that you'll that if you don't work, if you're not going on physicals and expires, the reason I would bet money you won't be successful ultimately is this: when you're doing 20 to 30 deals, you're getting a lot of referrals. You're doing business with people that know who you are. You're doing people that with you're doing business with people that kind of already trust you because somebody referred you. Um, you're not you're not competing a lot. Okay, and I competed with the a top ten in the world Remax team, top ten in the world in Lawton, Oklahoma, selling more than me. Okay, keep in mind I was selling a lot. I was fifteen percent market share. They had twenty two percent market share, dominating. It's like Goliath. They were bigger than me. They were, I mean, they were an incredible competitor. Um, much of what I had to say, they said it and said it better. Much of what I did to help a person be able to sell their home, they did it too. Um, much of what I spent, they spent more. Um, so I had a really tough competitor, and I had to learn how to beat them when they were spending more money than me, and and uh, you know, and they definitely weren't better by any stretch in terms of providing value to the customer, but the perception was that they were. So I had to get really, really good at competing. And and what made me able to compete with them was the number of people that I didn't win as going on FISBO and expired. I mean, I learned every objection. I knew everything you could say. I knew everything you would do to get me out the door. I knew everything. And, and there's processes you can build around how to win in every scenario. And the more face, it's, a, it's, it's the 10,000 hours. I don't care. You put anybody up against, if you've gone on 1,000 listing appointments and one person's gone on 10 listing appointments, I don't care how good a salesperson this one is right here, I'm going to put my money on the person who's been on 1,000. And, you know, so it's that, it's the, the being willing to go get the door shut in your face, being willing, just trying to help people is how you get your mindset around it. But just get more face-to-face -face opportunities and follow a process. Pay attention when you lose. Be curious. Call them. Why'd you hire them instead of me? 
why didn't you call me back? I thought, you know, it sounded like to me you were going to list with me. Is there anything I could have done differently? And you'll learn. You're just going to learn all these. They'll tell you everything you need to know. Well, actually, the other agent dropped to 5% after, you know, so you don't, okay, so maybe I shouldn't go first. I need to go last. You, you learn these things. And I can teach you every single one of them because I've been on 4,500 listing appointments and I've lost a whole, whole, whole lot of times. Uh, so I know how to, I know all the ways to lose. Therefore, I know all the ways to win. And you know that's where you got to have your focus and and mm. be diligent about that. And if you do that, you'll be successful. But if you don't do that, when what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, let me start doing some direct mail now to this neighborhood. I'm going to build a farm. Then four months into it, you're going to be, oh well, that's not working. Then you're going to stop. Uh, and then you're going to do something else. And then you're going to buy some leads. And then you're going to do this. And you're gonna, then you're just going to work on buyers. And you're going to say, okay, screw it. None of that shit works. I'm just going to hire some buyer agents. And all of a sudden, your strategy for growing your business is just whatever the hell works. And it's not what's going to get you to where you want to go. And that's, I did it too. So it's not anything bad. And, um, you know, it's just, that's, that's what ends up happening. But if you focus on just getting really good at what to say to set an appointment with a buyer or seller, specifically sellers in this case, um, and focus on what you do on the appointment, in what order, what the, what things you deliver before you arrive that's going to help build your trust so you don't have to sell yourself um, when you get there about me, 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 me. That's not going to help. That's resist. That's selling. That's not how you do it. Um, if you do focus on that, you're, you're, you're going to get there, man. I mean, that's the thing. And if you don't have somebody that's guiding you along the way, you need a coach. I mean, I've, I've always had a mentor. I've always had coaches my whole life. You'll never convince me that you shouldn't have somebody helping you to create the plan to give you clarity and to push back against your thinking and saying, hey, maybe what if it was this? What if it was that? How about if it was this? If this is really what you want to do or what this, you know, this is what this might look like five, two years from now, is that what you want it to look like? Somebody that's pushing back on your way of thinking, someone that cares enough about you to want to challenge you to do think differently, to look at it differently, to figure out a better way. And if you don't have that person in your life, and, and you know some of it's just our spouse, usually that's not the case. Usually they don't want to talk to us at all about our real estate business, nor do we want to talk to them. Um, but, but somebody that's pushing you and trying to make you better, that's what a coach should do for you. And, I, and that's, you know, that's ultimately why I'm in this business is because nobody really pushed me like that. I had to figure it all out. I did it the hard way. I crashed and burned. I, I, I spent a bazillion dollars trying to figure it out. And it would have been just easier if someone would have just laid it all out and helped me, you know, you know, do the right things in the right order and get clarity. But once you have that clarity, it becomes so much easier when you get to the office and you know, this is what I'm doing today. I know what I'm doing today. This I'm picking from this list. These are the most probably, these are the things that are going to make me the most money. This is what I'm going to do all day, every day until I get hit the target. It's real simple and everything else can, can you know, you can ignore all the noise and all the other agents saying this and that and the other and all the emails coming in saying you should do this and buy this thing or that thing or this new wild technology. Blah, 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 blah. Get face-to-face -face with sellers. You'll get to 100 deals. You'll make half a million dollars. It's that simple. And Jay, we've got one question that I wanted you to address real, real quick that I thought would be a good jumping-off point for you. So uh, James, from uh, he had the earlier question. Would you hire someone to set appointments for you on FISBOs and expires? Only if you've done it yourself. So the, this is where I've seen this work and where I've seen it fail. It's the hardest hire in the, in, the, in the business to make. It's the also most profitable hire you'll ever make in your business because here's the reality. Um, if, you ha if you've never made the calls, then they can tell you that you, you don't know what to tell them to do to be successful. I mean, you can't monitor their success. So, so if you've not made the calls and someone hung up on you and you called them back and said, and said hey, all, all I'm trying to do is help, um, you know, if, if you were going to, if you were, if you were still going to move, where would you be moving to? And you open back up that dialogue and then you set that appointment. If you've never done that before, um, then you're going to have a hard time teaching someone else to do it. So you have to have done it. And that, that comes back to that point I was making is if you haven't done it, I rarely see you successful because that, that's a, it's a free, it's a, it's the only two free pillars in your business, right? So if you close two or three for sale banners, two or three expires a month, let's just say one, you know, that's 10 grand for most of us, 10 grand. That's $120,000 a year, free money. You, you don't have any other levers you can pull on that are free $10,000 a month levers. So, so these, these are oil wells. They have to always be running in your business. So if you're going to make the hire, then, you, then know this. You have, to, you have to daily train them and manage them and, and hold them accountable 
And that's the hardest part of this transition because the first thing you want to do is you want to get off your plate so you don't have to do it anymore. I hated making those calls. I'm mm -hmm. happy to make that hire of an ISA, but it's also the hardest person in the, in the world to find that is going to do nothing but dial all day long. And that's the other benefit of making the hire as well, by the way, is you don't dial all day long. If you do, you're an animal. And I promise you, if you're dialing all day long, you're setting appointments. And you, your, your bigger problem is that you're out on too many appointments and you can't keep up with things. Um, but, it, you know, you, we don't dial all day every day. This person would be dialing all day every day. I mean, there, you, you, you can almost make a bad hire here and them still be productive for you. But, you know, the goal is to make a good hire and a really good hire in this position. Um, and that's, you know, and, and delegate that daily effort because it's free money. There's no other free levers. I'm telling you, if you just do that, um, and 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 you'll be able to you'll be able to um, leverage and be on more appointments and um, do the things that matter. Um, but that's the last thing you leverage. You should have three or four assistants before you hire out an ISA. Don't hire an ISA just because you you just want to get it off your plate. You have to leverage all the other areas of the business and do those things that matter. If you do that, um, you're, you're going to connect with more people. You're going to have more face-to-face -face interactions. All that results in creating your brand in your marketplace and people knowing who you are. So don't give up on the, the making the calls until it makes sense to do that. And that's usually going to be, you know, when you're when you're when you're closing five or six deals a month, you know, you're getting busy and 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 you're stop. What happens is you stop making some of those calls. Then you probably need to make one more admin hire after that, um, and then go to the ISA. You know what I'm saying? You should be closing eight or nine deals a month uh, with admins, and then stop making those calls. You know, you can delegate so much more of the business than 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 we naturally think that we should delegate. Um, but you know, stack up your IS, your 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 or your your admins because you can hire an admin for a much much lower amount um, to do all of those things that are are non dollar productive where you don't change the outcome. And you keep making those calls and getting face to face until you have more appointments and more listings than you can keep up with, and then get an ISA to do it. When you stop doing it, when you know that you ain't making your calls because there ain't no more time in the world, then it's time to make that hire for an ISA. Generally, it's getting close to 100 transactions where that hire needs to be made. Somewhere between 70 and 100. You can do it a little bit sooner. There's just more risk, and as long as you got some money set aside for that hire, then you can make the hire. But um, you know, there's a right time and a wrong time. And there's a there's a there's a what called a do not pass go do not collect $200 and you get to go all the way back to the start over again. That's what happens when you're going your business when you make mistakes <laughs> at this level. You get to go back to the beginning. You're out of freaking cash. You got to go do all the work again. Make calls, make calls, make calls, make calls. Da, 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 all the way around the board. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. And you can make that hire again. If you screw it up again, da, 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 back to the damn beginning with no more cash, and you got to try it again. So it's you know that's where having some guidance and some help and and you know some mentorship can help you get around the board a whole lot more uh, times, which is ultimately you know building more wealth and getting you out of. You know, you know, getting you to your goal uh, without having these, you know, these big mistakes that caught, take years to recover from is what what I've learned anyway. And Brian, is there any last question that you wanted to ask Jay in the, the few minutes that we've got left here? Um, I think he's done an amazing job. There's a billion gems in everything that he says. Sometimes you just wind Jay up and let him go and <laughs> you get the best out of him that way. Yeah. Um. I don't have any. I, you know, if people want more information, they can uh, speak with one of Jay's membership advisors, one of his success coaches. They'll do a free business evaluation assessment, no charge for it. One of the things about Jay Kinder is he's um, he's a giver, and um, you know, f take advantage of this limited opportunity to speak with a success coach, have them look at your business because everybody has different goals and everybody has different challenges. And to do that, simply go online, www.naea.com forward slash results. Tell us where you are in your business and what you want to accomplish. And speak with a success coach, and they'll give you some great specific distinctions that are relative to you today. So thanks, Matt. Thanks, Jay. Um, you were awesome as usual. And love to have you back again in the future if we can talk you into it. Always. Anytime. Love it. Thanks, Jay. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Yep. We'll see you on the next episode of Expert Advisor Hangout. Okay.